coupled with the question of Father Feeney is because in the recent past there has been a resurgence of interest in the man and in his cause. The number of supporters of Father Feeney and his theological position seems to be growing even at a rapid pace. The popularity of his ideas is clearly, insofar as I am able to discern, on the upswing. More and more, we see his name in traditionally oriented publications presented in a favorable light. More and more, it seems, he is looked upon as a hero of the faith and a defender of Catholic orthodoxy at a time that was a prelude to the disasters of the Second Vatican Council. The people who promote the cause of Father Fini and his image as well tell us that his excommunication in 1953 under Pope Pius XII was unjust and invalid. It was unjust his supporters say because he was excommunicated for his defense of Catholic orthodoxy in general and of the doctrine that outside the church there's no salvation in particular. And it was invalid, they insist, because of a defect of form. Father Feeney stirred the wrath of the liberals, we are told and the liberals used all the force at their disposal to persecute him and eventually to bring about his excommunication. <coughs> Thus was his excommunication in 1953, they say, really and truly for his defense of the church. The Catholic Church is the only means of salvation established by our Lord Jesus Christ. And the secular press, in some cases, has echoed the cry that Father Feeney was excommunicated for his teaching that there was no salvation outside the Catholic Church. For example, the obituary that appeared in the New York Times on February the 1st, 1978, under the headline, Leonard Feeney, Jesuit Priest, 80 ousted in dispute over salvation said this this is the obituary for father Leonard Feeney that appeared in the New York Times it says the Reverend Leonard Feeney a Jesuit priest who was excommunicated for nearly 20 years for his preaching that there was no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church died yesterday he was 80 years old. And so we asked the question, is it true? Was Father Leonard Feeney excommunicated for preaching that there was no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church? Was he, in fact, a great defender of Catholic orthodoxy and a hero of the faith? Or was he a disobedient priest who deviated from sound Catholic doctrine? These are the questions that need to be answered. It is therefore my intention to answer them. And I propose to do this in two conferences, as I mentioned, one this evening and one tomorrow. So this evening, we will consider the question of Father Feeney's excommunication and the reason for it. Tomorrow we will deal with the question, was Father Feeney a great defender of Catholic Orthodoxy and a hero of the faith, or was he a priest who deviated from sound Catholic doctrine? Uh, does someone want to do something about the, the speaker? Do we have to turn something down? begin
begin with some background because it is really important to know the background of the controversy and of the man himself. Father Leonard Feeney was born in Lynn, Massachusetts on February the 15th, 1897. He was the oldest of four children. There were three boys and a girl in his family and all the boys became priests. Father Feeney entered the seminary at an early age and was ordained in the year 1927. After his ordination, he studied at Oxford University in England for a time, and upon his return to America, he taught at Boston College. Father Feeney was a very gifted writer, and he was the author of many books. In 1934, he published a collection of essays entitled Fish on Fridays, which became a bestseller. In one of the essays in that book, he made it very plain that at that time, he believed a well-intentioned Protestant in good conscience could be saved. In the mid-1930s, Father Feeney was the literary editor of America magazine. He published a biography of Mother Seton and other works as well. And in 1952, he published the book, Bread of Life. This book, Bread of Life, is a collection of lectures that were given by Father Feeney at St. Benedict Center from 1942 to 1952. In the foreword to the first edition of Bread of Life, Father Feeney wrote this. He said, I have been persuaded by members of my order, the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that was the religious organization that Father Feeney established. He actually was a Jesuit priest. He says, I have been persuaded by members of my order, the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to publish some of the talks I have given on Thursday evenings at St. Benedict Center, Cambridge, Massachusetts, during the past 10 years. This book, Bread of Life, is a significant work because in it, Father Feeney sets forth his theological position with regard to some very important questions, namely baptism, justification, which we will explain tomorrow, and sanctifying grace. We will return to this work and to these terms when we consider his doctrinal teaching. And when we do return, I will explain them in such a way, I hope, that it will be clear what he is talking about. The name of Father Leonard Feeney is, of course, bound up with the name of St. Benedict Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In fact, his name is so identified with St. Benedict Center that one can hardly think of one without the other. And this is true even though Father Feeney was not a founder of the center. The center was established in March of 1940 by three laypersons. One of them was a married woman, Mrs. Catherine Clark. One was a man named Christopher Huntington, and the third one was Avery Dulles. This is the same Avery Dulles whose father was the late John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State under President Eisenhower. Avery Dulles was a convert to the Catholic Church, and he went on to become a Jesuit priest. Now, the reason that St. Benedict Center was established was to provide a safe haven for Catholic university students. It was to be a place where these young people could go to learn about the faith and to be bolstered in its practice so that the bad effects of the secular universities would be neutralized. And it was also to be a place where interested non-Catholics could go to find out about the Catholic Church. Now at the beginning, 
I alluded to the fact that support for Father Fenian's theological views seems to be growing at a rapid pace in certain circles of traditionally minded people. Among the supporters of Father Feeney is to be found the Catholic journal journalist Gary Potter. Mr. Potter was a founding editor of Triumph magazine. His articles have appeared in National Review, Human Events, The New York Times, The Wanderer, The Remnant, and in many other publications. Mr. Potter recently published a book about Father Feeney and the controversy surrounding him. The title of the book is After the Boston Heresy Case. <clears throat> I read that book very carefully and very thoroughly. And I personally believe that Mr. Potter made a sincere effort to present the facts about Father Feeney in an objective manner. Yet at the same time, there is no doubt that he is a strong supporter of the man and his cause. According to Mr. Potter, Father Feeney was introduced to St. Benedict Center in 1942 by a friend of Mrs. Catherine Clark, who was one of the founders, as I mentioned. And later he was asked to become the spiritual director at the center and this he agreed to do with the permission of his Jesuit superior. At first, Father Feeney worked at the center on a part-time basis, but by 1945, his work at the center was so time-consuming that he sought and received permission from his superior to work there full-time. It was 1945. It was about the same time that Father Feeney began his search for what might be called the doctrinal missing link that would explain the corruption of the faith in America as he perceived it. Father Feeney perceived that there was something wrong with the quality of faith among many Catholics in America. And in 1945, according to Gary Potter, who was a supporter of Father Feeney, in 1945, he began to wonder what was the cause of this perceived corruption of the faith in America as he saw it. He reasoned to himself that there must be something missing, something that has either been neglected or de-emphasized that accounts for the lukewarmness, if you will, of the faith among so many in this country. He then set out by study and thought to find out what this displaced doctrine was, what the missing link that would explain the transition from the teaching of sound Catholic doctrine to doctrinal corruption. He searched for this doctrine for two years, and he discovered it, according to Mr. Potter, in 1947. In July of 1947, he announced to the center, that is the St. Benedict Center, that surely extra ecclesia nulla salus, that is outside the church there is no salvation, was, to quote Gary Potter, the displaced linchpin doctrine they sought in which the church needed to reaffirm. So for two years, he thought and he studied in 1947, he apparently discovered a doctrine which he certainly was taught when he studied theology, but perhaps which slipped from his consciousness. And then in July of 47, he announced to the people at St. Benedict Center 
that this was the doctrine. Outside the church, there is no salvation. From that time on, the doctrine outside the church, there's no salvation, became the celebrated cause of Father Feeney. In time, in fact, his name became so associated with the doctrine that many came to believe that his eventual excommunication really was due to his preaching of the doctrine. As we have already pointed out, even the New York Times reported that Father Feeney was excommunicated for preaching that there was no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church. It was in July of 47 that Father Feeney announced the discovery of this displaced doctrine. But that was not the beginning of Father Feeney's troubles. Contrary to a fairly common perception, Father Feeney's troubles did not begin when he started to emphasize the doctrine. There were already problems between Father Feeney and his Jesuit superiors, and between St. Benedict's Center and the Archdiocese of Boston, before his great discovery that the Catholic Church taught that it was the only institution established by our Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of mankind. One source of the difficulty that Father Feeney had was the spirit of independence that seemed to prevail at St. Benedict's Center. Again, if we go back to a favorable source, Gary Potter, he says that when St. Benedict Center transformed its lecture program, well, that's what they did originally, they would give a series of lectures and Father Feeney would give a lecture every Thursday evening. And Mr. Potter says that when he transformed the lecture program into St. Benedict Center School, Neither the Society of Jesus, Jesuits, nor the Archdiocese of Boston was consulted. So they had permission to have the center, and certainly the permission to give the lectures. And at a certain point in time, they decided to turn a lecture series into a school. And they did not consult either the Archdiocese or the superiors of the Feeney. Now that may not seem like such a big thing to us, but for the center in Father Feeney to do such a thing without consulting the Archdiocese or his Jesuit superiors, in the context of the 1940s, it would cause considerable difficulties. In the 1940s, bishops ruled their dioceses with authority according to the provisions of the Code of Canon Law. Well, the Code of Canon Law says that bishops have authority over all schools in the diocese that have anything to do with Catholics. It is not unreasonable that establishing a school in the 1940s without the permission of the local ordinary would cause problems. And so, for example, in their commentary on Canon 1381 of the Code of Canon Law, the canonists, Father Zabo and Hannon, say this. They say, the religious training of youth in all schools, whatever, is subject to the authority and the supervision of the church. In a similar way, they, that is the local ordinaries, have the right to approve the instructors in religion and the textbooks of religion, and even to protect religion and morals to demand that both the instructors and the textbooks be removed. The right and duty vindicated in this canon are not restricted to schools established by the church. Furthermore, Father Feeney also refused to allow Jesuits, men from his own order, to help out at the center and this refusal did not go over well with his superior who had allowed him to work at the center in the first place. 
After making it clear that Father Feeney's Jesuit superiors supported his work at the Santa Gary Potter says of his superiors, quote, their view would only begin to change when the man, that is Father Feeney, denied other Jesuits, those enrolled at Harvard, the opportunity to help at the center. And then came the great controversy which followed Father Feeney's so-called discovery of the doctrine, outside the church there is no salvation. Speaking of Father Feeney's Jesuit superiors, Gary Potter says their changed view sharpened in the summer of 1947. It was that summer when Father Feeney constantly discussing the matter with other center faculty and members determined which was the displaced doctrine. The following summer in August of 1948, Father Feeney was informed by his Jesuit superior that he was being transferred from St. Benedict Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts to Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. Father Feeney was not happy with the transfer, but he obeyed nevertheless because he was a Jesuit and he was under the vow of obedience. He had been assigned to St. Benedict Center by his superior and now his superior was assigning him someplace else which the superior had every right to do. If anyone knows anything about religious orders or congregations, they know that fact. Not only does the superior have the authority to order you, but you have taken a vow to Almighty God that you will obey your superior. In other words, it has even more force than, say, for example, case of a diocesan bishop and his clergy, his clergy make a promise of obedience, whereby they are subject to the ordinary of the diocese, but a religious, in a religious order or congregation, they make a vow, not to their superior, but they make a vow to Almighty God that they will obey their superior. And certainly, appointments and assignments come within the view of the vow. About that there is no question. In fact, it was a general principle that when someone was assigned or reassigned, it was always under the vow of obedience. Father Feeney, for his part, he packed his bags and he left St. Benedict's Center for his new assignments. But shortly after his departure from the center, he was visited at Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts by two young men from the center. These young men went to him to plead with him to return. Father Feeney apparently resisted their pleas and they finally persuaded him by telling him that the very least he could do would be to go back and listen to the case that was being made by the people who were there at the center. People who felt very close to him, very loyal to him, and very attached to him. At least they said, go back and listen, and then make up your mind about what you're going to do. And Father Feeney agreed to go back and to hear what they had to say. He met with the people at St. Benedict Center. He listened to their pleas that he stay, and he made his decision. His decision was to remain at St. Benedict Center in spite of the command of his provincial superior to leave. He decided that he would disobey. Father Feeney's decision to stay at St. Benedict Center was not communicated to his superior by him at first. He was communicated to his provincial superior by the people at the center. We are hereby informing you, they wrote to Father Feeney's superior, that by our unanimous request, Father Feeney will continue to lead our work until we get a fair hearing from higher authorities. 
the letter to Father Feeney's provincial was dated September the 9th, 1948. Gary Potter says that the provincial did not deign to answer the letter from St. Benedict Center, but he wrote Father Feeney the next day. His letter began, for your sake and for the societies, is the Society of Jesus, I plead with you to end all connection with St. Benedict Center at once and to report to Holy Cross next Monday. The following month, on December the 29th, 1948, Father Feeney Superior wrote to him again, ordering him to leave St. Benedict Center and to report to his new assignment. The Superior told Father Feeney that he would appoint another priest and this other priest would be sent to St. Benedict's Center to replace him for the Feeney. He was also informed by his superior that his priestly faculties to hear confessions would cease on December 31st of that year, just a question of a few days. Again, Father Feeney, Father Feeney disobeyed. His refusal to obey was then followed by his establishment of this religious organization which he called the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which Father Feeney later referred to as My Order. This took place on January 17, 1949. The founders of the order, that is the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart, were Father Feeney and Mrs. Catherine Clark. Mrs. Clark became a member of the order and took the name Sister Catherine. But she continued to live with her husband, Hank. At first, the slaves of the Immaculate Heart made a vow of obedience. Later, they added a vow of chastity. This presented a major difficulty because many of the members were married with children. Their marital status and their children presented two serious problems, at least. As for the marriage problem, Canon 542 of the Code of Canon Law makes it very plain that married persons for the duration of their marriage are invalidly admitted to the novitiate. This means that they cannot become religious as long as their spouse is alive even though they may be separated and even if the other spouse consents that his spouse may enter religion. Now in the Middle Ages it was permitted but under the Code of Canon Law that was uh, put together as a result of the work of St. Pius X it became very clear that that is not permitted any longer. So as long as one's spouse is alive, one cannot enter a religious congregation. And the other problem, of course, was the children. What are you going to do with the children? We're talking about almost 40 children. The solution they adopted was a strange one by any standard. It was to raise the children communally. Gary Potter, who as we mentioned is very sympathetic to the cause of Father Feeney explains, he writes, and I quote, besides their farming, another of the slaves' the main activities after the move to Still River was the rearing of the community's children. The decision to raise them communally was made while everyone still lived in Cambridge. First they lived in, in Cambridge, where the St. Benedict Center was, and they later moved to Still River. That's what he's referring to. He goes on, he says, although the center's married couples wished to live more like religious, and could possibly do so by living as brother and sister, as long as the children were not involved, how could they do that when in fact they had children to raise? He goes on to say, 
the decision to raise the children communally was the solution to that problem. It was what lay behind the decision. It also launched, and this is still Gary Potter, it also launched the slaves into uncharted waters. In modern times, no Catholic religious association has attempted anything like it. If someone in the historical past has tried it, the example does not come to mind, he says, apart from heretical movements like the Cathars. In any event, Gary Potter says, once the zeal and earnestness of the married couples and the other younger center members prevailed over the caution of Father Feeney and Sister Catherine, some procedure had to be adopted. That is to say, for the raising of the children communally, as in a commune. For those of you, by the way, who are not familiar with the group referred to by Mr. Potter, I would point out what the 1913 Catholic Encyclopedia says about the group that he mentioned. It says the Catharis system was a simultaneous attack upon the Catholic Church and the then existing state. The Church was directly assailed in its doctrine and hierarchy, but the worst danger was that the triumph of the heretical principles meant the extinction of the human race. For the Cathari, no salvation was possible without previous renunciation of marriage. I don't mean to imply that Father Feeney, what he did and what he approved of was equivalent to what the Cathari did in the Middle Ages. What I do mean to imply is that to do such a thing like that exhibits a certain detachment from reality and from common sense. Mr. Potter goes on to say of Father Feeney on the communal raising of children, and I think most of you will agree with me when I read what he says. And this is a quote, the children's parents effectively cease to exist. As parents to the children, and more so as a child grew from three to five to ten and older. Care was taken, this is Mr. Potter, that the children had no direct or special contact with their parents, save on a half dozen major feasts during each year, when the entire community would gather for socializing. On these occasions, the children might chat with their parents, but after a certain time, the parents were seen by the children as scarcely more than another big brother or big sister. And that ends the quote. But a Catholic priest, and a Jesuit at that, who would sanction such a thing, raises very serious questions about his prudence, his common sense, and the soundness of his judgment. On April the 18th, 1949, Father Feeney was suspended from his priestly duties and Catholics were forbidden to take part in the activities of St. Benedict's Center. Father Feeney responded the next day by saying that his removal from St. Benedict's Center was invalid. One of his superiors, Father Louis Gallagher, called Father Feeney to tell him that the sanctions would be lifted if he left St. Benedict Center and went to Holy Cross College. But Father Feeney refused to leave. He invoked his conscience as a justification for remaining at St. Benedict Center. He said in a statement prepared and released to the press, prepared for and released to the press, he said, it was and is a matter of conscience to me, in the sanctity of my priesthood, as I openly declare to every superior I could contact. 
a few days later, on April 21st, 1949, Father Fina received yet another command from his provincial superior to go to Holy Cross College. This command was given to him in virtue of Father Fini's vow of obedience. It was therefore binding under pain of mortal sin. Father Fini again disobeyed. Three and a half months later, on August the 8th, 1949, the sacred congregation of the Holy Office wrote to Cardinal, to Archbishop Cushing, the subject of the necessity of the church for salvation. This decree that was sent to the Archbishop of Boston was voted on in plenary session of the Holy Office on Wednesday, July the 27th, 1949. It should be pointed out that unlike the other Roman congregations, the Roman congregations are those bodies which are used by the Pope to rule the church, but unlike the other Roman congregations, in the case of the Holy Office, the head of the Holy Office, the prefect of the Holy Office, is the Pope himself. So the prefect of the Holy Office that sent the letter to the Archbishop of Boston was Pope Pius XII. The first prefect of the Holy Office was St. Pius V before he was Pope. But from the time of St. Pius X, the position of prefect was always held by the Pope. The letter or the decree of the Holy Office, which was approved by the Pope, was sent to the Archbishop of Boston in response to the controversy that arose in the wake of Father Feeney's interpretation of the doctrine, outside the church there is no salvation. Now even though this decree was approved by Pope Pius XII, who, as we mentioned, was the prefect of the Holy Office, Father Feeney would later refer to it as, quote, this heretical letter, unquote. Considering that the acts of disobedience on the part of Father Fini were both grave and numerous, and that he intended to persevere in the dispositions that produced those acts, they had no intention to amend his ways. Father Fini was expelled from the Jesuit order on October the 10th, 1949. Just under three years later, on September the 4th, 1952, Archbishop Cushing summoned Father Feeney to appear before him within the month. He called upon Father Feeney to make his submission to the local ordinary and to the Holy See. Father Feeney was informed that the Congregation of the Holy Office, with the approval of Pope Pius XII, had put him, Father Feeney, in St. Benedict Center under interdict. On September 24th, 1952, a letter was sent from St. Benedict Center to Pope Pius XII, in which the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office was accused of heresy. The heresy, the letter said, was contained in the August 8th, 1949 letter, which I mentioned a moment ago, the letter of the Holy Office to the Archbishop of Boston. On October 25, 1952, Cardinal Pizardo, who was then the Secretary of the Holy Office, wrote to Father Fini from Rome in the name of the Holy Office. He said, and I quote, The Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office has been obliged repeatedly to make your teaching and conduct in the Church the object of its special care and attention. And recently, after having again carefully examined and calmly weighed all the evidence collected in your cause, it has found it necessary to bring this question to a conclusion. However, the letter goes on, His Holiness, Pope Pius XII, in his tender regard and paternal solicitude for the eternal welfare of souls, 
committed to his supreme charge has decreed that before any other measure be carried into effect, you, that's Father Fini, be summoned to Rome for a hearing. Therefore, in accordance with the express bidding and by the special authority of the Supreme Pontiff, you, Father Fini, are hereby ordered to proceed to Rome forthwith and there to appear before the authorities of the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office as soon as possible, unquote. For the Fini did not obey this summons. He responded instead with a letter on August 30th, 1852. The following month, that's November of 1952, Father Fini received the second letter from the Holy Office summoning him to Rome. He was ordered to present himself before the Holy Office no later than December the 31st, 1952. He was told in the second letter from Rome that if he failed to obey, his disobedience would be made public along with the canonical penalties. Father Fini was also informed that his expenses for the trip to Rome would be paid by the apostolic delegate. But Father Fini refused to comply with this second command to appear before the Holy Office. Instead, he responded with a long letter dated December the 2nd, 1952. And then, early in January 53, Father Fini received a third letter from Rome. By this letter, he was ordered to appear before the Holy Office no later than January 31st, 1953, under pain of excommunication for failure to appear. Father Fini refused to go. He again disobeyed the command of the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office, and this for the third time. Instead, he responded with yet another letter dated January 13th, 1953, in which he accused the Holy Office of outrageous, barbarous behavior and with heresy. On February the 4th, 1953, in response to Father Feeney's refusal to appear for the third time, the Holy Office met in plenary session and declared that Father Feeney was excommunicated. Decree of excommunication dated February 13, 1953, says this, and I quote, Since the priest Leonard Feeney, a resident of Boston, St. Benedict Center, who for a long time has been suspended from his priestly duties, on account of grave disobedience of church authority, being unmoved by repeated warnings and threats of incurring excommunication, if so facto, means automatically, has not submitted. The most eminent and reverend fathers charged with safeguarding matters of faith and morals in a plenary session held on Wednesday, February the 4th, 1953, declared him excommunicated with all the effects of the law. On Thursday, the 12th of February, 1953, our most holy Lord, Pius XII, by divine providence, Pope, approved and confirmed the decree of the most eminent fathers in order that it be made a matter of public law. Given at Rome, at the headquarters of the Holy Office, 13 February 1953, unquote. So the question, why was Father Fini excommunicated? Father Fini was ordered in virtue of his vow of obedience and thus under pain of mortal sin to move from St. Benedict Center to Holy Cross College. He repeatedly disobeyed his legitimate superior. Subsequently, he was ordered by the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office to appear at Rome three times. Three times he was commanded to go to Rome. Three times he disobeyed. They even offered to pay his travel expenses. 
And finally, in response to the third summons to appear before the Holy Office, Father Feeney accused the Holy Office, and by implication, the prefect of the Holy Office, Pope Pius XII, of outrageous, barbarous, and heretical behavior. Father Feeney accused the Holy Office of heresy, in spite of the fact that Pius XII was its prefect. There is no question that the Holy Office had every right to summon Father Feeney. And he, for his part, was obliged under pain of mortal sin to obey the summons. Just as he was obliged under pain of mortal sin to move from St. Benedict's Center to Holy Cross. First, he chose to disobey his Jesuit superiors. Then, he chose to disobey the Holy Office. And in response to the third summons, he charges the Holy Office with heresy. Thereby, as we mentioned, implicitly charging its prefect, Pius XII, with the same crime. Is it any wonder that he was excommunicated? I don't think so. I think, in fact, that Pius XII was perhaps too indulgent. Clearly, Father Leonard Feeney was excommunicated for a disobedience that was both grave and scandalous. He was not excommunicated for upholding Catholic doctrine or for preaching that there was no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church. He remained unmoved in the face of repeated warnings and threats of incurring excommunication ipso facto. He refused to submit to the legitimate authority of the church as exercised by the Holy Office, whose prefect was Pius XII. And quite frankly, what is so strange to me personally about this whole affair is that when Father Feeney was given the opportunity to go to Rome to appear before the Holy Office where he could defend his charge of heresy and his interpretation of the doctrine outside the church, there is no salvation, he refused to take it. It was a golden opportunity for him to put forth what he believed was the true interpretation of that doctrine. And it was his golden opportunity to go there as well to substantiate what is nothing less than a reckless charge of heresy against the Holy Office and Pope Pius XII, at least implicitly. Is that the behavior of a great defender of Catholic orthodoxy? I think not. I think a great defender of Catholic truth under those circumstances would have welcomed such an opportunity to defend the truth as he saw it. But Father Feeney stayed home. He stayed home and he was excommunicated for it. Finally, I would like to point out that this conclusion that Father Feeney was excommunicated for disobedience and not because he taught that outside the church there's no salvation is not to imply, is not to say that disobedience was the only problem. For disobedience was not the only problem. There was another problem which was far more serious even than his studied disobedience and his reckless accusation. And the other problem that was far more serious is the problem of unsound doctrine. A lot of people are under the impression that Father Feeney, in his attempt to defend this doctrine, made himself a hero of the faith. But the truth of the matter is, and I will prove it tomorrow in the second part of this talk, the truth of the matter is that Father Feeney was guilty of very grave 
doctrinal errors. Serious doctrinal errors. Which were related to the teaching of the Catholic Church, the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent on baptism, on justification, and on sanctifying grace. So I thank you. We'll take a little break. And in the course of the break, Father will give out the papers to collect whatever questions you may have. questions and try to answer them as best I can. The first question is, what happened to Gary Putter? I see that he is no longer writing in The Wanderer. I don't know. <clears throat> is it true that Father Feeney's excommunication was lifted after he assented to the Athanasian Creed? I think the answer is that Father Feeney was reconciled to the Novus Ordo Church at one point and the apparent means was that he simply recite the Athanasian Creed and that was good enough for them and apparently it was good enough for him. Please explain the doctrine outside the church there is no salvation. Well the talk tomorrow will be about that, it will examine the teaching of Father Feeney in his own words, and then we will compare what he taught with what the church taught. And in comparing the two, I think it will be clear exactly what is meant by the doctrine outside the church there is no salvation. So to get into that right now would be simply to anticipate uh, what we will say tomorrow and perhaps the questions that will be asked. This is David Kubiak, professor of Latin at Wabash College, Indiana, and a member of the Coalition in Support of Ecclesia Dei. He has warned readers of Latin Mass magazine that the Society of St. Pius X and the Society of St. Pius V are anti-Semitic organizations. How should we respond to this accusation? Well, I can only speak for myself and for the priest of the Society of St. Pius V. The answer is that it is not so. Another question, what is the Catholic Church's teaching about salvation outside the Catholic Church? Again, we will get into that tomorrow. It says, when Fidel Castro was fighting with the rebels, the rebel army in Cuba, before he came to power, his fellow Jesuit, his fellow priest, sorry, yes, his fellow priest was a Jesuit, he was not a priest, Castro. Could it be possible that the Jesuits were being corrupted even then with communist ideas, liberation theology, and perhaps even his superior? What do you think? Well, I don't know that the Jesuits were ever the same after, and I don't know that they were not either, but after they were restored, they were suppressed in the 18th century at the, the insistence a very powerful liberal and Masonic influences in Europe, pressure put on the European monarchies was subsequently put up on the Pope and the Jesuits were suppressed and then they were reestablished 
and some people wonder if they ever had the same uh, caliber of priests after the restoration that they had before and I don't know for sure but it seems if you look at the work they did afterwards they did a lot of very good work when can we reasonably expect new priests to be ordained they're so badly needed uh, it will be uh, some years until we train them uh, and then ordain them we just have to be patient and we have to be sure to do it the right way so what is the difference between error and heresy the difference between Error, and error here is a, a kind of general term. There are a, a wide variety of things that could be classified as error. Heresy is a very specific term. <clears throat> and heresy means to deny or to doubt any article of divine and Catholic faith. So there has to be divine and Catholic. And what that means is that it has to be revealed by God and then infallibly taught by the church for it to be divine and Catholic and for an erroneous teaching to be heretical it must be a denial or doubt of such a teaching which is properly speaking a dogma in the strict sense of the word dogma for something to be a dogma it must, be it must be divinely revealed and infallibly taught. And heresy, again, is to deny or doubt a dogma. But there are many other infallible teachings of the church which are not, strictly speaking, dogmas. And the denial of which would not, in the strict canonical sense, constitute a heresy. That does not in any way diminish the reality that these other teachings, which would be, for example, of ecclesiastical faith, would be as infallibly true as a dogma, strictly speaking. But heresy uh, is narrowed down to those things that were divinely revealed and infallibly taught by the church. For example, the, some of the things we will talk about tomorrow, the teaching of the Catholic Church on justification. That is to say, the movement of a soul from the state of being an original sin to the state of sanctifying grace is justification. The person is justified before God. And there are certain dogmas, strictly speaking, about the teaching of the church on justification and on sanctifying grace, for example. And as I say, we will get into those tomorrow because the position that was taken by Father Feeney, his position about baptism of water being absolutely necessary for salvation, as we will see, implicitly calls into question certain dogmas of the Catholic Church on baptism, on justification, and on sanctifying grace. When a, a saint is canonized by the church, we call that a dogmatic fact. And it is infallibly true. When the church, properly speaking, a legitimate Roman pontiff canonizes someone, that person is in heaven. We know infallibly that they're in heaven. That's a dogmatic fact, but it's not a dogma. It would be a mortal sin to call into question for example, the fact that St. Pius X is in heaven, but it would not, strictly speaking, be a heresy. It says, if, as you say, Father Feeney was more seriously guilty of grave doctrinal errors, <clears throat> then how can you reconcile this with the statement of Pope Eugene IV in his bull, Cantate Domino, with which Father Feeney was in full agreement? He was teaching the same thing. In that bull, the Pope says that none of those existing outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews and heretics and schismatics, can have a share in life eternal. 
No one, even if he pour out his blood for the name of Christ, can be saved unless he remain within the bosom and the unity of the Catholic Church. Well, that is a question, a very good question, actually, uh, and a question which goes to the heart of what we will talk about tomorrow. Because it focuses in on a number of things. In other words, clearly it is the teaching of the Catholic Church that outside the church there's no salvation, that our Lord established only one church. And the one church that he established was the Catholic Church. And that all other religions, however well motivated certain members may be, all other religions are in truth false religions. The Catholic Church is not, as is taught by the modernists, simply one part of a greater Christianity. Part of the modernist teaching is that there is this greater Christianity, and the Catholic Church is one part of it, albeit the best part of it, but still just part of it. This is reflected in the new code of canon law where, we talk, where it talks about the faithful of Christ as Catholic members of the faithful of Christ. That is an implicit denial of the fact that in the strictest sense, the Catholic Church is Christianity. The Catholic Church is the only church established by our Lord. So the question is a very good question, and it is a question that touches on the very heart of the issue uh, which was raised and is being raised now by the supporters of Father Feeney. And I will show you tomorrow, I believe in a convincing fashion, that the position espoused by Father Feeney is not only erroneous, but it is implicitly heretical, because it implicitly calls into question at least three dogmas that is truths divinely revealed and infallibly taught. And that we will do tomorrow. It says, will you give Mr. Potter or someone from St. Benedict Center a chance to answer your selected commentary? Uh, this would surely give opportunity for a better understanding of the history and the issues is this not the purpose of an open forum? Well, I would gladly debate Mr. Potter or anyone from the group that supports the position of Father Lenafini. And I would not do it so as to enter into a dialogue because, as I will prove to you tomorrow, Father Feeney, in his attempt to hold on to his own doctrine, his own particular doctrine with regard to baptism of water, not the doctrine of the church, sacrificed on the altar of his doctrine at least three dogmas of faith. And that I will show tomorrow. But the answer is, I would be willing, yes, to debate uh, in an open forum those who support the position of Father Feeney. Why did you not specify the reasons plainly stated by Mr. Potter as to why he did not choose to go to Rome? That is, Father Feeney. For example, he was not informed of the charges preferred against him according to canon law. He was not given to prepare, he was not given opportunity to prepare his defense according to the law. Well, the question is really equivalent to a parent saying to a teenage son, be in before 10 o'clock or I will impose certain penalties on you. And the teenager turning around and saying, you can't impose penalties on me until we have a trial until you specify the reasons why I have to be in before 10 o'clock. And they have to be written out and 
they have to be notarized so that I will have sufficient opportunity to respond to what you say. I say that because the Holy Office, the Supreme Congregation of the Holy Office, was the guardian of faith and morals in the church. And the head of the Holy Office was the Pope, Pope Pius XII. And the Holy Office had every right in the world to say to a priest, we want you to come and appear before us. And the priest had the obligation on the pain of mortal sin to appear before the Holy Office. And furthermore, we get back to the other question, the question of why did not Father Sini welcome the opportunity to go to Rome and to defend his interpretation of the doctrine and his accusations of heresy against the Holy Office itself. So in other words, when the church uses its authority under normal circumstances and orders a priest to a subject to that authority, I mean, Father Finney would say you cannot be saved unless you're subject to the Roman Pontiff. The church says, you come to Rome, I want to talk to you. The church has the absolute right to do it and the individual has the obligation to go. Otherwise, every single summons made by the church under normal circumstances could be met with a barrage of correspondence. I mean, that is, quite frankly, a technique that people use. Authority says, you come and you answer to us, and they get a letter back and say, well, explain this, explain that, and tell me this and tell me that. The authority has a right to say to come, and the subject is obliged to go. The argument that the Holy Office did not specify everything exactly the way Father Fini wanted it to be specified is not a solid argument. It is simply, uh, in my estimation, to make up an excuse that has no foundation for his failure to go. I think even Mr. Potter said that he should have gone. <clears throat> it says, why was the chronology of this story mixed up? For example, his mistake, his mistake of allowing communal living did not arise until after he was separated or isolated. Did not his isolation affect him much the same as many of the current do as your own thing, no jurisdiction, free wheeling traditional groups. Well, I think I specified the fact that the communal living, the strict communal living that was instituted uh, after they left St. Benedict Center uh, in Cambridge, I think I specified that that did occur afterwards. And the reason it was brought up in that particular chronology is because the establishment of the slaves of the Immaculate Heart happened at that time. And since it's not possible in the time allotted to, to give every detail, I don't think that it was out of place to mention something so significant uh, as that, which I personally think exhibits uh, as I said, a very grave lack of prudence and common sense. In fact, I, when I first read it, could not believe that Father Feeney, a Jesuit priest, would allow something like that to occur. That these children, I believe there are 39 children, that these children would be, in effect, separated from their mothers and fathers, and they would not even be permitted, except on about half a dozen occasions in the course of the year, to have contact with them. I think it's absolutely outrageous and I think it is an example of the kind of mentality that produced the doctrinal errors of Father Leonard Feeney. And I will show you, as I say tomorrow, specifically and exactly how it is that Father Feeney rejects and rejected these teachings of the Catholic Church. From his own writing, I will show that. So the the quote.
quote-unquote Fenians claim that the propaganda war was already in progress. I'm not sure what the word is. As for the Feni and those running the Holy Office would not specify the charge against Father Feeney, which is required by canon law in such a summons to a trial. Uh, that is not true. It is not required by canon law when the Holy Office summons someone to appear before it. It is not required to specify specific charges. The Holy Office, in a general sense, made reference to the trouble that had arisen, but in any case, Father Feeney could have been excommunicated simply because he refused, in a public manner, the command of his Jesuit superior to accept the transfer from one place to another, a command that he swore before Almighty God that he would obey under the vow of obedience. Remember that. It's not simply the case of a diocesan priest subject to the local ordinary with the promise of obedience. The promise of obedience is made to the bishop. In the case of a religious like Father Feeney, that promise is a vow because it is made not to the church, but it is made to God himself. And Father Feeney disobeyed. If he had a point to make, that was fine. But the fact that he had a point to make did not justify him in doing what he did. And his failure to submit at that time to an authority that he himself would acknowledge to be legitimate is, in my estimation, inexcusable. So the defenders of Father Feeney state that baptism by desire was only introduced by the Baltimore Catechism in the U.S. Prior Catholic catechisms and statements by popes and saints of all ages teach otherwise, that is, no salvation outside the church. Well, we will get into that question tomorrow, the question of baptism of desire, but that is not true. For the Feeney, in fact, leveled a charge of heresy against Cardinal Gibbons and the Baltimore Catechism, saying that the Baltimore Catechism taught that there were three baptisms, baptism of desire, of, of blood, and of water. And Father Feeney said that that was heresy. But you can go to the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas, the third part, the section on baptism, and St. Thomas Aquinas says exactly what the Baltimore Catechism says. And yet Father Feeney said that this was introduced uh, in to the Baltimore Catechism by the American bishops. I mean, historically, it's just absolutely false. It's not true. But as I say, we will get into that in detail tomorrow. Prior Catholic catechisms and statements of the saints of ages teach otherwise no salvation outside the church. That is a dogma of faith. It is true that the Catholic Church is the only institution founded by our Lord for the salvation of souls and that one must be a member of the church or as has always been taught from the time of St. Augustine, from St. Cyprian, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, to the Council of Trent, to the Catechism of the Council of Trent, to Pope Pius IX, that has always been taught that a person can be joined to the church by desire and intention. And again, we will see that that is true tomorrow. In fact, it is the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent that desire for baptism is sufficient for the justification of a soul. That is to say, for the washing away of original sin and for putting that soul into the state of sanctifying grace. And by the way, Father Feeney accepted that. In Bread of Life, he very clearly says there is such a thing as baptism of desire. But we will get into that tomorrow. The Apostolic Digest published by Father Feeney's apologist lists hundreds of quotes to this effect, that is, to the effect that there is no salvation outside the church. Well, again, there is no dispute that that is a doctrine of the Catholic Church. The dispute is over the meaning of it in relationship to 
the sacrament of baptism in relation to the doctrine of justification and in relation to sanctifying grace. So the enemies of Father Fini, uh, bishops Cushing and Bishop Wright, etc., were later the enemies of Archbishop Lefebvre. Can we not look at this as an example of the modernist attacking Orthodox priests? You know me by my enemies. Well, actually, I think in point of fact, uh, Cardinal Wright at the time supported uh, the work of Archbishop Lefebvre and gave him uh, a letter of approval. But no doubt, after the big trouble with the Vatican in 1976, I have no doubt that Cardinal Wright, subsequent to that, would take a position in opposition to Archbishop Lefebvre, as I am sure Cardinal Cushing would. Uh, in a similar vein, it may be that Father Feeney had a point to make. I don't dispute that, and it may even be that the doctrine he emphasized is the doctrine that must be emphasized. I mean, there was something wrong, not only in the church in America, but there's something wrong throughout the world. There had to have been something wrong for the changes to be so devastating so quickly. If the faith was in fact strong in the hearts and in the minds of Catholic people in this country and throughout the world, the modernists at the Second Vatican Council and afterwards could not have effected such a bold and dramatic and sweeping change as they did. So I agree that there was something wrong, and I also agree that maybe it is this doctrine uh, that has to be preached. But I also think that the individual who may have done more damage to the preaching of this doctrine, the single individual, is perhaps Father Feeney himself. And the reason I say that is, if I get up in the pulpit on Sunday and I give a sermon on the Catholic Church, how it is the only institution established by our Lord for the salvation of the human race, and if I start to read the sources, uh, is to say the explicit teaching of the popes and councils, about the fact that the Catholic Church is the only institution of salvation and I say to the people there is no salvation outside the church immediately I have to start to explain it and the reason I have to start to explain it is because of Father Feeney Father Feeney in my personal opinion is the one who put this doctrine uh, in a bad light so that every time we say there is no salvation outside the church, we have to explain, well, I don't mean it the way Father Feeney meant it. And I don't mean it the way Father Feeney meant it. Because, as we will see, the way Father Feeney meant it involved the implicit rejection of at least three dogmas of faith. So that is the last question. And I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. God bless you. In part one of this uh, talk, which was given last night, we dealt with the question of Father Feeney's excommunication. We saw that he was not excommunicated for preaching that there was no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church, claims to the contrary <clears throat> notwithstanding. He was excommunicated for a disobedience that was both grave and scandalous. Three times the Holy Office summoned him to Rome. Three times he disobeyed. 
And then in response to the third summons that he had received, he charged the Holy Office with heresy. In accusing the Holy Office of heresy, he implicitly accused Pius XII of heresy as well. And for those people who think that the Holy Office was somehow liberal and that, we, and that what we had at the Holy Office, in the Holy Office at that time, was something similar to what we had after the Second Vatican Council, it is not true. In fact, one of the main reasons for calling the Second Vatican Council, according to Xavier Rin, who wrote a series of books about the Council and also who uh, approved of the liberal changes, he says one of the reasons for calling the Council was because John the 23rd could not get around the Roman Curia, that is to say the Roman congregations of which the first is the Holy Office. In fact, he recounts an interesting story in which John the 23rd called into his office the cardinals who were members of these Roman congregations and he, he asked them to resign because he knew that his reform, his intended reform would be severely hindered by these very conservative cardinals and bishops. And so he called them in and he asked them to resign and they simply said to him, no, we won't resign. <clears throat> and in uh, Xavier Rin's book about the, the council, he says that John XXIII just stood there in amazement <clears throat> saying to himself, well, I'm the Pope, well, I'm the Pope, as they walked away. You see, they knew, the cardinals knew what would happen if the council was actually called and they did everything in their power to prevent the calling of the Second Vatican Council? So these cardinals then who were involved in this process with regard to Father Feeney were not liberal cardinals. They were very conservative men, very devoted men, men who constituted a serious obstacle to the reform of the Second Vatican Council and who had to be neutralized and they were effectively neutralized by Paul VI when he reformed the Roman Curia. They had to be neutralized in order for the reform to take hold in the church. And it was these men that Father Feeney was accusing of heresy and as I mentioned to you uh, last night, Pope Pius XII was the prefect of the Holy Office, and so by implication he was accusing Pope Pius XII of heresy as well. Now, Father Feeney at no time questioned the papacy of Pius XII, nor did he say that this was an illegitimate Holy Office. He recognized that Pius XII was the Pope, and he recognized the authority at least theoretically, of the Roman Curia and of the uh, Holy Office itself. So it was this legitimate authority, which he recognized as a legitimate authority, that he accused of, he accused of heresy after he refused a threefold command, command which was binding under pain of mortal sin, to go to Rome and to appear before the Holy Office. And again, as I mentioned last night, <clears throat> I personally believe if Father Feeney were, even by way of intention, a hero of the faith, I mean, you could have a person who is a hero of the faith and with good intentions, who gets all mixed up about certain things and digs a hole for himself, but the question is, why did he not go to Rome? Why didn't he go there? <clears throat> to back up his accusation of heresy <clears throat> and to defend his interpretation of the doctrine outside the church there is no salvation. 
so we now proceed to the question, was Father Feeney, in his disobedience, a great defender of Catholic orthodoxy and a hero of the faith, even by way of intention, or was he a man who deviated from sound Catholic doctrine? Obviously, to answer this question, it is necessary to examine the theological teaching of Father Feeney and then to evaluate it in the light of Catholic doctrine. And this is what I intend to do this morning. As we mentioned in the first part of the talk uh, last evening, it was in 1945 that Father Feeney began his search for the missing doctrine, the abandonment of which would explain the decay of the faith in this country as he perceived it. In 1945, he began the search. In 1947, he discovered the missing doctrine, the displaced doctrine, as Gary Potter wrote about it. And then in July of 1947, he announced what it was to the people at St. Benedict Center. He announced, as Gary Potter writes in his book after the Boston Heresy case, and I quote, that surely extra ecclesiam nulla salus, that is outside the church there's no salvation, was the displaced linchpin doctrine they sought and which the church needed to reaffirm, unquote. From that point on, from July of 1947 on, the doctrine outside the church there is no salvation became the celebrated cause of Father Feeney and of the St. Benedict Center. The theological dispute that followed revolved around that doctrine. But one thing has to be made very clear. It did not revolve around the existence of the doctrine. <clears throat> It revolved around the meaning of the doctrine. Archbishop Cushing, however liberal he may have been, did not say there was no such doctrine. Cardinal Wright did not say there was no such doctrine. The Holy Office certainly did not say there was no such doctrine. They all agreed that that was the doctrine of the Catholic Church. It was the meaning of the doctrine that brought about the great controversy. For Father Feeney, the doctrine very simply meant that in order to be saved, that is to say in order to go to heaven, you must actually be a baptized member of the Catholic Church, that is to say you must be incorporated into the church by baptism of water. Now, everything revolves around that, the entire controversy. It revolves around the point that Father Feeney would say that you must be baptized with water in order to get to heaven. So that's the way we actually could sum up the position of Father Feeney without baptism of water, there is no salvation. And this is his position, even though he, Father Feeney, contrary to popular impression, did believe in baptism of desire. If you talk to people who have heard of the controversy and you ask them, did Father Feeney believe in baptism of desire? My guess is that nine out of ten would say, well, of course not. He denied such a thing as baptism of desire, but that is not true. He believed in baptism of desire. He quite readily admitted that a person could be justified the person could be put into the state of sanctifying grace by desire for baptism 
before he actually received the waters of baptism. <clears throat> now, it may sound a bit complicated, this word justified. I will explain it in greater detail a little further on, according to the teaching of the Council of Trent. But just for the sake of clarification, when the word is used here, what it simply means is that you have a person who is born with original sin, who is outside the church, who does not have access to the merits that our Lord won on the cross. He is a child of Adam. To be justified means to move that person from the status of being a child of Adam to the status of being a child of God. That's what it means to be justified. It's like going before a court and being charged with a crime and being found innocent. When you're found innocent, you are justified before the law. So that's simply what it means to be justified. You're born a child of Adam in a state of original sin, and you move from that state to a state of being a child of God through baptism. That's justified. And uh, a part of justification, an essential part of justification, the positive part, so to speak, would be sanctifying grace. So Father Feeney, he admitted that there was such a thing as baptism of desire, and I will quote him to show you that he did admit it. He admitted that a person by baptism of desire could be justified and put into the state of sanctifying grace. He admitted that. But while admitting these things, he emphatically denied that a person who is justified and put into the state of sanctifying grace as a result of desire for baptism could be saved. So Father Feeney would say, yes, desire for baptism can justify a person to take away original sin before they receive the water of baptism and put them into the state of sanctifying grace, but that person can never go to heaven. That's the position of Father Feeney. On page 25 in his book, Bread of Life, which I mentioned to you last night and which is a very important work in trying to understand the mind of Father Feeney, on page 25, here is what he says. He says, and I quote, in the New Testament, you cannot be justified unless you want the water Jesus bequeathed us on the Mount of Olives. You cannot be justified unless you want it and cannot be saved until that water is poured on your head. And then he goes on to say, and he says it with emphasis because it's emphasized in the original text, he says, and I quote, it is now baptism of water or damnation. If you do not desire that water, you cannot be justified, and if you do not get it, you cannot be saved, unquote. From these words of Father Feeney, three things are clear. The first thing is that an unbaptized person can be justified by baptism of desire. He says it clearly. The second is that a person justified by baptism of desire can never be saved without the waters of baptism, baptism of water. And the third thing that is clear from what Father Feeney said in that quote is that there is an essential distinction between justification and salvation. So he says you can be justified by desire, you can never be saved even though you are justified by desire, therefore there is an essential distinction between what it means to be justified and what it means to be saved. I hope that's clear. It, it may sound more complicated than it actually is, but those three simple points if you grasp those three simple points, then you will grasp 
what I'm trying to say. That you can be justified by desire for baptism, by the thing he admits, but you can never be saved unless you're baptized with water, and therefore there is an essential difference between justification and salvation. In these three points, we have the fundamental teaching of Father Leonard Feeney. We will now consider each point in some detail, and then we will compare what Father Feeney taught with the teaching of the Catholic Church to see if Father Feeney was a defender of Catholic orthodoxy and a hero of the faith, or a man who deviated from sound Catholic doctrine. So now we're going to take each of those points, those three points, and consider them separately. So the first point is a justification by desire for baptism. <clears throat> now, I have no doubt, as I mentioned before as well, that it does come as a surprise to some people that Father Feeney did believe in baptism of desire. For it is quite commonly understood that he did not. Nor is it any wonder why there is this impression. Father well, Feeney did not write in a strictly systematic way. Uh, Gary Potter in his book quotes some Jesuit at saying he was the greatest theologian in the United States, but he does not write, write like a theologian. <clears throat> Father Feeney was a, a very fine author and a poet, and quite frankly, he writes his theology more uh, as a poet, I believe, than he does as a theologian, contrary to what some people say. He does not present his position in a very systematic fashion, and so people have a tendency to draw conclusions which perhaps are not warranted. For example, the conclusion that he did not believe in baptism of desire when we know he did. But on the other hand, you could say we understand why people have the impression that he did not believe in baptism of desire because he did accuse Cardinal Gibbons and the Baltimore Catechism of Heresy for teaching that there were three kinds of baptism, baptism of water, baptism of desire, and baptism of blood. In the light of this accusation against Cardinal Gibbons and the Baltimore Catechism, we have to wonder what Father Feeney would say about St. Thomas Aquinas. For well, St. Thomas Aquinas in his Summa Theologica cites the epistle of St. Paul to the Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 2, to the effect that St. Paul speaks of, quote, the doctrine of baptisms in the plural. And St. Thomas says of this passage of St. Paul, Hebrews 6, uh, verse 2, uh, St. Thomas says, speaking of St. Paul, and this is a quote from St. Thomas, he, St. Paul, uses the plural, that is baptism, because, and this is St. Thomas, there is baptism of water, of repentance and of blood, unquote. That's in the third part of St. Thomas's Summa, question 66, article 11. On page 40 of Father Feeney's book, Bread of Life, from which we will quote throughout the talk, as I mentioned, here's what, again, Father Feeney says. He says, a man in the Old Testament waiting and wanting baptism to be instituted, and a man in the New Testament waiting and wanting baptism to be administered could both be justified in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And by justified, Father Feeney correctly understands getting into the state of sanctifying grace. <clears throat> he makes this very clear on page 18 of Bread of Life where he says, and I quote, Getting into the state of grace is justification, unquote. So clearly then, Father Feeney admitted that desire for baptism was sufficient for justification, and that by justification he meant getting into the state 
of grace. And yet, while he admitted that a man could be justified and thereby put into the state of sanctifying grace by desire for baptism, he absolutely insisted that such a person could never, and the word never is his word, be saved. In other words, such a person could never get to heaven. And this brings us to point number two. The second point is that a person justified by baptism of desire could never be saved without baptism of water. In pages 120 and 121 of Bread of Life, Father Feeney presents a series of questions and answers in a kind of catechism form in order to express his position on the matter. And here's what he says, <clears throat> and again I quote him from his book, page uh, 120 and page 121, question, what does desire, what does baptism of desire mean? Answer, it means the belief and the necessity of baptism of water for salvation and full intent to receive it. Question, could baptism of desire save you if you really believed it could? Answer, it could not. Question, could it possibly suffice for you to pass into a state of justification? Answer, it could. Question, if you got into the state of justification with the aid of baptism of desire and then failed to receive baptism of water, could you be saved? Answer, never, unquote. Father Feeney thus held that a man could be justified by desire for baptism. He could get into the state of grace in this fashion, but even though he was in a state of grace, he could never be saved. He could never get to heaven unless he had baptism of water. <clears throat> Nor did it matter to Father Feeney whether the person failed to receive baptism of water through his own fault or not. On page 126 and 127 of Bread of Life, Father Feeney writes, and I quote, If you do not receive baptism of water, you cannot be saved, whether you are guilty or not guilty for not having received it. If it was not your fault that you did not receive it, then you just do not go to heaven. You are lacking something required for heaven. You did not add your own positive rejection of the requirement so as to give you a positive deficiency. Yours is a permanent lack of something required for eternal salvation, unquote. <clears throat> well, the question is, what happens to a person who is justified in the eyes of God by desire for baptism and who is thus in the state of sanctifying grace if that person, before receiving baptism of water, through no fault of his own, dies. What happens? Here is a man who is justified in the state of grace. <clears throat> he dies before he is baptized with water. The answer Father Feeney gives is found on page 125 of Bread of Life. He says, quote, I myself would say, my dear children, that a catechumen who dies before baptism is punished, unquote. And then he goes on to say on the same page, it is now baptism of water or damnation. If you do not desire that water, you cannot be justified, he continues, and if you do not get it, you cannot be saved. Just think of the implications of Father Feeney's teaching. Here is a man who is justified in the eyes of Almighty God by desire for baptism. He is in the state of sanctifying grace. He therefore has in him a created participation in the very life of God because that's what sanctifying, that's what sanctifying grace is. We have the life of God in us when we are in a state of grace. He is a child of God. He has the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. He believes in the Catholic faith. He loves God above all things. He relies on the merits of Jesus Christ for his salvation. He has perfect contrition for his sin. He is devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary and says his rosary every day. He is preparing for baptism 
but before he receives it, he dies. Father Feeney would say that such a man can never be saved and therefore can never go to heaven because he was not baptized with water. But where does this man go in a state of grace? Where does he go? Father Feeney said, quote, it is now baptism of water or damnation. If you do not desire that water, you cannot be justified. <clears throat> and if you do not get it, you cannot be saved. And this brings us to the third point. In Father Feeney's position, and that is the distinction between justification and salvation. For Father Feeney, there is an essential distinction between the two. For him, as we have shown, a person could be justified <clears throat> and therefore could get into the state of grace by desire for baptism. But such a person could never be saved without the waters of baptism. Recall again his words. In the New Testament, you cannot be justified unless you want the water bequeathed by Jesus to us on the Mount of Olives. You cannot be saved until that water is poured on your head. It is now baptism of water or damnation. Justification and salvation for Father Feeney are essentially different things. Nor is this difference simply a question of the fact that a justified person in the state of grace before death is capable of committing a mortal sin and hence of falling from grace. We all know that. We all admit that. We know that until a person dies in the state of grace, he is capable of falling into mortal sin and therefore losing grace and losing his soul. But that is not what Father Feeney is talking about in the distinction between justification and salvation. <clears throat> he clearly teaches that a person who is justified and in the state of grace can never be saved unless and until he is baptized with water. Therefore, again, for Father Feeney, there is an essential difference between justification and salvation in that justification is not sufficient for salvation in the theology of Father Feeney. Here is what he says on pages 17, 18, and 19 of Bread of Life. He says, justification is only the divine courtyard of salvation, the preparation field where you are given the grace to be tried out as you move God words. Do you see clearly that justification and salvation are not the same thing? Father Feeney says, justification is a divine probation. And then he goes on, <clears throat> is, is getting into the state of sanctifying grace, salvation? No. What is it? Getting into the state of sanctifying grace is justification. And finally he says, but justification and salvation are two different things. Justification is the road to salvation, but it is not it. It is the journey, but not the goal. Now we certainly do agree with Father Feeney that we achieve salvation after death. We do not believe that once you're on a state of justification in this world that you must be saved as the Protestants believe. But we do not agree <clears throat> that justification and salvation are, are not, that justification is not sufficient for salvation. We do not agree with that. Justification is sufficient for salvation. This notion of Father Feeney, as we will show, that justification is not sufficient for salvation is contrary to the teaching of the saints and the solemn teaching of the Catholic Church. Now, uh, another distinction has to be made, uh, and it is that there is a difference between a soul that is justified by desire for baptism and a soul that is justified by baptism of water. We do not say there is no difference. There is a difference. 
What we are simply saying is that the difference between those two souls, one justified by desire for baptism and one justified by the waters of baptism, <clears throat> the difference is not sufficient to deprive a person of heaven who is justified by desire for baptism. So the question is, what is the difference then between this person who is baptized with water, we have a little baby who was just baptized this morning, what is the difference between that little baby and a person who is preparing to become a Catholic and whose heart is on fire with love for God and with desire to be baptized or the case of a person who actually dies for the faith without being baptized. What is the difference between that little baby and this person justified by desire and this person justified by the shedding of his blood? The difference is this. The difference is that the person who is justified by water receives on his soul what is called the character of baptism. It is imprinted on his soul by the waters of baptism. The person who is justified by desire or blood does not receive the baptismal character. St. Thomas Aquinas, in part three of the Summa, question 66, article nine says, baptism imprints a character which is indelible and is conferred with a certain consecration. Baptism of desire does not imprint this character upon the soul even though the sins of the person are forgiven and the person is put into the state of sanctifying grace and this failure to receive the character the indelible mark of baptism is true equally with baptism of desire and baptism of blood because neither baptism of desire or baptism of blood is, strictly speaking, a sacrament. And so, St. Thomas, speaking of baptism of desire and of blood, says that they, quote, are like baptism of water, not indeed in the nature of sign, but in the baptismal effect. Consequently, they are not sacraments. So St. Thomas says you have baptism of desire and baptism of blood, baptism of water, these two are like baptism of water, not in the sense that they are, not, they are outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace, but in the effect that they produce on the soul with regard to the remission of sin and the infusion of sanctifying grace. So baptism of blood and baptism of desire are not sacraments. <clears throat> and it is precisely because they are not sacraments that they do not imprint the baptismal character on the soul, but otherwise they produce, as St. Thomas says, the baptismal effect. What effect? The person becomes a child of God and his soul is flooded with sanctifying grace. So that would be the difference between that little baby baptized this morning and someone uh, justified by desire or by the shedding of his blood. That baby has a character, an indelible character printed upon its soul that will remain there for all eternity. Now, Father Feeney would, of course, object to the notion that there are three baptisms. He would say that such a thing was opposed to the teaching of St. Paul, who speaks in his epistle to the Ephesians of one faith and one baptism. And then he says, those who say there, are baptism of, there is baptism of desire, of blood, uh, and of water, go contrary to the teaching of St. Paul in his epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 5, where he says there is one faith, <coughs> excuse me, and one baptism. But you know something? St. Thomas Aquinas anticipated Father Feeney. He lived some time before him in the 13th century. And so St. Thomas, in part three, question 66, article 11 of the Summa Theologica, St. Thomas says, and I quote, the other two 
baptisms are included in the baptism of water which derives its efficacy both from Christ's passion and from the Holy Ghost. Consequently, for this reason, the unity of baptism is not destroyed, unquote. In other words, baptism of blood and desire are not outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace. They are not sacraments, properly speaking, but they are like the sacrament of baptism in the baptismal effect, to use the words of St. Thomas, that is produced in the soul, namely the remission of original sin, of actual sin, and the infusion into the soul of sanctifying grace. Now, this is not the teaching of 20th century liberals in Boston, Massachusetts. It is the teaching of the angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas himself, and this teaching was upheld by the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent. This teaching, therefore, of St. Thomas flies in the face of the doctrine of Father Feeney. It flies in the face of his distinction which he created between justification and salvation. Recall, if you will, the questions and answers of Father Feeney which we have already quoted. Question, could baptism of desire save you if you really believed it could? Answer, it could not. Question, could it possibly suffice for you to pass into the state of justification? Answer, it could. Question, if you got into the state of justification with the aid of baptism of desire and then failed to receive baptism of water, could you be saved? Answer, never. The essential error of Father Feeney then is rooted in his novel distinction between justification and salvation. And this uh, distinction that he created out of uh, a whole fabric, this distinction of Father Feeney's involves uh, errors that touch both justification and sanctifying grace. In these matters, Father Feeney seriously departs from the doctrine of the Catholic Church. And the reason he does it is to foster and to protect his own doctrine as regards baptism of water. His doctrine, the doctrine of Father Feeney, is that it is impossible to get to heaven without baptism of water. And when he came to that conclusion, that doctrine, in order to defend that doctrine, he had to sacrifice certain other teachings of the church because Father Feeney knew that the Council of Trent taught that a man can be justified by desire for baptism. And what Father Feeney sacrificed was the teaching of the church on the nature of justification and on sanctifying grace. The Protestant Reformation was rooted in a rejection of the teaching of the Catholic Church on justification. Martin Luther held that human nature was completely corrupted by original sin. He taught that the redemption could, uh, did not bring about a restoration of human nature from that state of corruption. For Luther, justification was therefore nothing more than a juridical act by which God declares the sinner to be justified, although he remains intrinsically unjust and sinful. So in the Lutheran system, uh, justification did not affect, did not bring about an inner sanctification of man. In Luther's mind, when, when a person was justified by Christ, all it meant is that outwardly, externally, he had the appearance of a child of God but inwardly, he was still filled with corruption. Father Ludwig Ott, in his book, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, which is available, has been reprinted by Tan Books, explains it in this way. He says, uh, for Martin Luther, on the negative side, justification is not a real eradication of sin, but merely a non-imputation or covering of guilt. So the sinner remains a sinner, except the sins that he is guilty of and that he still has on his soul 
un unheld against him. On the positive side, in the Lutheran system, it is not an inner renewal and sanctification, but merely an external imputation of Christ's justice. The subjective condition of justification is fiducial faith, that is, the confidence of man which is associated with the certainty of salvation that the merciful God will forgive him his sins for the sake of Christ. So in the Lutheran system, a man puts his trust in God, puts his trust in our Lord. He says, our Lord will save me. And by that act of confidence in our Lord, that person is put into the state of justification, but it is simply an external thing. Inwardly, he is as corrupt after he is justified as he was before he was justified. And that is why in the Lutheran system, sin doesn't matter. Luther did say, sin boldly, but believe more boldly. So there is this inner corruption that remains in man. The Catholic doctrine on justification is radically different from that of Martin Luther. In Catholic teaching on the negative side, when a man is justified, it takes place a real eradication of sin. Sin is really eradicated, it is gone. Sin is really and truly taken away. It is not just covered up. And on the positive side, it takes place an inner renewal and sanctification of the soul. So when you are in a state of grace, when you are justified before God, your sin is taken away and your soul has the life of God. In fact, St. Teresa of Avila said if we could see a human soul with our eyes, the simplest person who is in a state of sanctifying grace, we would be absolutely dazzled. We would be overwhelmed with the beauty of the soul of a person who is in a state of sanctifying grace because there is a positive sanctification and renewal of the person who is in a state of sanctifying grace. This positive sanctification is actually caused by sanctifying grace because sanctifying grace is actually a participation, a created participation in the life of God. And so a man who is in a state of grace, however mediocre he may be, however weak in virtue he is, however attached to worldly things, he finds himself uh, to be, that person in a state of grace is truly sanctified. He is made in his soul supernaturally beautiful. He is a friend of God, he is a child of God, and he is an heir of heaven. He is all these things for one reason, and that reason is sanctifying grace, which is, as I said, a creative participation in the life of God. And so it is that if a man dies in the state of grace, he must be saved. He cannot not be saved because he is a child of God by grace, and by grace he has a right to heaven. <clears throat> and God could no more deprive him of heaven than he could bestow the beatific vision on the devil. For God to deprive someone of heaven who dies in a state of sanctifying grace would be contrary to his own goodness, his own divine nature and the order that he has established and it doesn't matter how that person got into the state of grace it doesn't matter how that person became a child of God and an heir of heaven if he is in the state of grace when he dies he is a child of God he is an heir of heaven and he is therefore necessarily saved even if he has to go to purgatory for a thousand years, he is still saved. To deny that a person who dies in the state of sanctifying grace, whether he's baptized with water or not, to deny that that person is saved is to deny the teaching of the Catholic Church 
and justification and sanctifying grace. One has only to consider the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent on justification to understand this. You know, the Council of Trent was probably the greatest council in the history of the church. It was convened in order to counteract the errors of the Protestant Reformation. It opened on December the 13th, 1545, and it closed on December the 4th, 1563. The Catholic Encyclopedia of 1913 says this in its article about the Council of Trent. It says its main object was the definitive determination of the doctrines of the church in answer to the heresies of the Protestants. On January the 13th, 1547, the Council of Trent issued its decree on justification. In the opening paragraph of the decree, the Council said this, and I quote, Whereas there is at this time, not without the shipwreck of many souls and grievous detriment to the unity of the church, a certain erroneous doctrine disseminated touching justification. The sacred and holy ecumenical and general synod of Trent, lawfully assembled in the Holy Ghost, proposes unto the praise and glory of Almighty God the tranquilizing of the church and the salvation of souls to expound to all the faithful of Christ the true and sound doctrine touching the said justification which doctrine the son of justice jesus christ the author and finisher of our faith taught which the apostles transmitted in which the catholic church the holy ghost reminding her thereof has always retained most strictly forbidding that any henceforth presume to believe preach or teach otherwise than as by this present decree is defined and declare. The decree of the council proceeded in 16 chapters and 33 canons to present the infallible teaching of the Catholic Church on justification. In the previous year, on June 17, 1546, the council issued its decree concerning original sin. In that decree, the council declared that, quote, Adam, when he had transgressed the commandment of God in paradise, immediately lost the holiness and justice wherein he had been constituted, and that he incurred the wrath and indignation of God, and consequently death, with which God had previously threatened him, and together with death, captivity under his power, who thenceforth had the empire of death, that is to say, the devil, unquote. Thus the council said that by original sin, Adam had lost holiness and justice. He incurred the wrath and indignation of God. He was made subject to death and was a captive under the power of the devil. Our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to deliver man from this bondage, which deliverance was prefigured by the deliverance of the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt by Moses. Thus, our Lord came to eradicate sin and to restore man to holiness and justice. He came to conquer death and to deliver man from the power of the devil. In other words, our Lord came into this world to move man from that state in which he was a child of Adam and under the dominion of the devil to a state of grace and adoption as a child of God. The movement from the first state, that is to say the state of being a child of Adam under the dominion of the devil, the movement from that state to the second state of being a child of God is the very meaning of justification. The Council of Trent thus answers the question, who are justified through Christ, in chapter 3 of the decree of justification, it says, But though he died for all, yet do, yet do not all receive the benefit of his death. 
but those only unto whom the merit of his passion is communicated for as in truth men if they are not born propagated of the seed of Adam they would not be born unjust seeing that by that propagation they contract through him when they are conceived injustice as their own <clears throat> and that is another reason by the way that our Lord was born of a virgin because original sin is passed on through the man not through the woman it's passed on through the father not through the mother so our Lord was born of a virgin not only because he was the eternal son of God but also because it would not be fitting that he should be born of a creature who is able to transmit original sin so the council says if they were not born again in Christ they never would be justified seeing that in that new birth there is bestowed upon them through the merit of his passion the grace whereby they are made just thus a child of Adam becomes a child of God through the merits of Jesus Christ he receives a new birth and in that birth he receives the grace whereby he is made just in other words he is justified thus does the Council of Trent infallibly define justification quote as being a translation from that state wherein a man is born a child of the first Adam to that state of grace and of the adoption of the sons of God through the second Adam Jesus Christ our Savior hence those who are justified have been translated from the state of sin to the state of grace and they are thus adopted children of God by the merits of Jesus Christ clearly then justification as infallibly taught by the Council of Trent is not a divine probation as Father Feeney taught it is the translation of a person from the state of being a child of Adam to the state of grace and the adoption of the sons of God to the second Adam Jesus Christ our Savior a person who is justified is a child of God he is an heir of heaven whether he was justified by the waters of baptism or by the desire for those waters if he is in the state of sanctifying grace he is a child of God there are today countless saints in heaven who never received the waters of baptism and who do not have upon their souls the indelible mark of the sacrament of baptism Saint Joseph for example was not baptized he does not have on his soul the indelible mark of the sacrament of baptism and yet he is the greatest of saints second only to the virgin mother of God those saints in heaven were justified not by baptism of water but by baptism of desire or of blood since they died in the state of grace they were saved the fact that they did not have the indelible mark on their souls which is placed there by the sacrament of baptism does not prevent them and did not prevent them from entering heaven they were justified they died in the state of grace and they were saved Martin Luther denied that justification brought about an inner renewal and sanctification by the fiend he admitted the inner renewal and sanctification to some degree but he denied the essential effect of justification and sanctifying grace because he held that a soul justified and in the state of grace by means of desire for baptism could never be saved without baptism of water again his words not my words <clears throat> he said and I quote it is now baptism of water or damnation if you do not desire that water you cannot be justified and if you do not get it you cannot be saved but the Council of Trent infallibly taught that justification was a translation from that state wherein a man is born a child of the first Adam 
as we have mentioned, to that state of grace and the adoption of the sons of God through the second Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the decree of the council says in this translation, since the promulgation of the gospel cannot be effected, in other words, in order to move a person from the state of unrighteousness, uh, the state of original sin, to the state of justice and grace, in order to move them, the Council of Trent says, and I quote, this translation, since the promulgation of the gospel, cannot be effected without the labor of regeneration, that is the waters of baptism, or the desire thereof. As it is written, the Council says, unless a man is born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this statement from the Council of Trent is infallible. In other words, it is infallibly true that one can be moved from the state of being a child of the first Adam to the state of being a child of God through desire for the labor of regeneration. In other words, through the desire for baptism. And if you read the decree, you notice very quickly that the Council of Trent, which was infallible, does not distinguish between two kinds of justification. One that is brought about by baptism of water and one that is brought about by baptism of desire. It speaks only of one justification which is effected by, quote, the labor of regeneration or the desire thereof, unquote. So in other words, that justification is effected, it is brought about by desire, and this is an infallible truth of the Catholic Church. It is therefore the same state of justification and the same state of grace that results whether the person is put into that state by baptism of water or desire for the sacrament. Therefore, a person who dies in the state of justification whether justified by the waters of baptism or the desire for them, is and must be saved. The status of two such souls as regards salvation is the same. And again, this is true even though a person justified by desire for baptism does not have upon his soul the character of baptism, which is the indelible mark that is put there by the waters of baptism. As regards the uh, justification and grace, the baptismal fact is the same whether one is justified in one way or the other way. <clears throat> and that is why the person who has not received baptism of water cannot be admitted to the sacraments because he does not have that indelible mark upon his soul. He cannot be admitted because baptism of desire and baptism of blood are not sacraments properly speaking <clears throat> and one is not by them actually incorporated in to the church. In such cases, one is rather joined to the church by desire and intention. In the teaching of the Council of Trent, we see clearly the erroneous character of Father Feeney's doctrine touching on baptism of water, on justification, and sanctifying grace. Father Feeney substantially deviated from the teaching of the Catholic Church. Since his interpretation of the doctrine outside the church, there is no salvation involved a claim that one could never be saved without baptism of water for the fiend necessarily had to reject the teaching of the church on justification and sanctifying grace. He knew that the Council of Trent explicitly taught that one could be justified by desire for baptism. He also knew that a justified person was in a state of grace. Admitting these things, he nevertheless rejected the consequences of justification and grace in order to protect his own doctrine on the absolute necessity of baptism of water for salvation. <coughs> Excuse me, recall his words. Question, if you got into the state of justification with the aid of baptism of desire and then failed to receive baptism of water, could you be saved? Answer, never. The essential error then of Father Leonard Feeney was not that he taught there was no salvation outside the church, for that is a true doctrine of the church. Christ our Lord founded only one church, 
apart from which no one can be saved. Thus, to be saved, one must be joined to the Catholic Church either by actual membership in the Church, which is effected by baptism of water, or by intention and desire. And this intention and desire is effected by baptism of blood or desire. And this baptism of desire is also referred to by St. Thomas and some of the other saints as baptism of repentance. As St. Thomas says in part three of the Summa Theologica, speaking first of baptism of blood and then of desire or repentance, St. Thomas says, I answer that, as stated above, Baptism of water has its efficacy from Christ's passion to which a man is conformed by baptism and also from the Holy Ghost as first cause. So why does why is that little baby that was baptized this morning now a child of God? Why is the soul of that little baby flooded with sanctifying grace? Why is there a mark on the soul of that baby which will remain there for all eternity? St. Thomas says it is because of the passion of Christ and because of the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what he means when he says, Baptism of water has its efficacy from Christ's passion to which a man is conformed by baptism and also from the Holy Ghost as the first cause. The priest says the words. The priest pours the water. But it is the passion of Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost that cleansed the soul of that baby of original sin and put onto the soul of that baby that indelible mark. So then Thomas goes on to say, he says, now although the effect, that is to say, the, the efficacy of baptismal water depends on the first cause, that is, the passion of Christ and the Holy Ghost, <clears throat> the cause far surpasses the effect. So in other words, the passion of Christ and the Holy Ghost are far superior to the sacrament of baptism. They, the cause, far surpass the effect. Nor does it, that is the first cause, the passion of Christ and the Holy Ghost, depend upon it, that is upon the sacrament of baptism. In other words, the power of Christ's passion and the Holy Ghost far surpasses the sacrament of baptism, nor is the power of the passion of Christ or of the Holy Ghost limited by the sacrament of baptism. God did not put himself into a straight jacket when he instituted the sacrament of baptism. His power is above and beyond the sacrament of baptism itself. As St. Thomas says, Consequently, a man may without, and this is a direct quote from St. Thomas, a man may without baptism of water receive the sacramental effect from Christ's passion insofar as he is conformed to Christ by suffering for him. Hence it is written, these are they who are come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In like manner, St. Thomas continues, a man receives the effect of baptism by the power of the Holy Ghost, not only without baptism of water, but also without baptism of blood. For as much as his heart is moved by the Holy Ghost to believe in and love God and to repent of his sins, wherefore this is also called baptism of repentance. Thus, therefore, St. Thomas says, and these are his words. Each of these other baptisms is called baptism, for as much as it takes the place of baptism. Wherefore, Augustine says, the blessed Cyprian argues with considerable reason from the thief to whom, though not baptized, it was said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise, that suffering can take the place of baptism. Having weighed this in my mind, Again and again, and this is St. Cyprian, I perceive, St. Augustine, reflecting on St. Cyprian, I perceive that not only can suffering for the name of Christ apply for what is lacking in baptism, but even faith and conversion of heart, if perchance, on account of the stress of the times, 
the celebration of the mystery of baptism is not practicable. Unquote. This teaching of St. Cyprian, St. Augustine, St. Thomas is reflected in the teaching of the Council of Trent and is found as well in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. The Catechism of the Council of Trent says, should any unforeseen accident make it impossible for adults to be washed in the salutary waters, their intention and determination to receive baptism and their repentance for past sins will avail them to grace and righteousness. For the Feeney's accusation of heresy, therefore, against Cardinal Gibbons and the Baltimore Catechism for their teaching on baptism of desire and blood is an absolute outrage, and it is an absolute absurdity. For in this accusation of heresy, he would have to include St. Cyprian, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, not to mention the Council of Trent and the Catechism of the Council of Trent. It may be, my dear people, that at one time, as I mentioned yesterday, Father Feeney had a valid point to make in opposing the liberal tendencies of his day, which sought, no doubt, to water down the doctrine of the necessity of the church for salvation so as to make it almost meaningless. But that is no excuse for him to deviate from Catholic tradition and the infallible teaching of the church on baptism, justification, and sanctifying grace. His errors are very grave, for they involve the implicit denial of certain dogmas of the faith. As I mentioned to you, a dogma in the strict sense is a truth that has been divinely revealed and infallibly taught by the church, and the denial of such a dogma is heresy. Here is how Father Ludwig Ach explains it in his Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. He says, dogma in the strict sense is the object of both divine faith and Catholic faith. It is the object of divine faith by reason of its divine revelation. It is the object of Catholic faith and account of its infallible doctrinal definition by the church. If a baptized person, and this is Father Ott, deliberately denies or doubts a dogma properly so called, he is guilty of the sin of heresy and automatically becomes subject to the punishment of excommunication. Now, coming to the conclusion here, I would point out the following truths are taught by the Council of Trent and are dogmas of the faith in the strict sense. The denial of these truths would constitute heresy. Three, one, sanctifying grace sanctifies the soul. Two, sanctifying grace makes the just man a friend of God. Three, sanctifying grace makes the just man a child of God and gives him a claim to the inheritance of heaven. The person who is justified is in the state of grace, as Father Feeney readily admitted. Such a soul is therefore truly sanctified, such a soul is a friend of God, and such a soul has a claim to the inheritance of heaven. Thus one who dies in the state of grace must be saved as we have already pointed out, whether that person is put into the state of grace by baptism of water or by the desire for the sacrament. To say otherwise, to say that a soul justified and in a state of grace can never be saved unless and until he receives baptism of water is to implicitly deny these dogmas of the faith. Three dogmas which we have quoted. Now, Father Feeney, as we have pointed out, explicitly admitted that desire for baptism was sufficient for justification and that a justified soul was in the state of grace. On page 18 of Bread of Life, he said, getting into the state of grace is justification. The problem is that he went on to most emphatically declare that such a justified person did not have a claim to the inheritance of heaven. On page 121 of Bread of Life, he wrote, question, if you got into the state of justification with the aid of baptism of desire and then failed to receive baptism of water, 
Could you be saved? Answer, never. To say such a thing is to implicitly deny the dogmas which we listed, namely, that sanctifying grace sanctifies the soul, that sanctifying grace makes the just man a friend of God, and that sanctifying grace makes the just man a child of God and gives him a claim to the inheritance of heaven. And so, my dear people, we return to the place where we began. For now, we are in a position to answer the question that we posed at the beginning. Was Father Feeney a great defender of Catholic orthodoxy and the hero of the faith, or was he a man who deviated from sound Catholic doctrine? Clearly, he was a man who deviated from sound Catholic doctrine. It is impossible, therefore, that he was a great defender of Catholic orthodoxy and the hero of the faith. Father Feeney was a gifted writer and a zealous soul, but so was Martin Luther. And while they're not equivalent men, they certainly did similar things. Luther sacrificed Catholic truth on the altar of his own doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Father Feeney sacrificed Catholic truth on the altar of his doctrine that it was impossible to be saved without baptism of water. For traditional Catholic people, however, Father Feeney is a greater danger than Martin Luther. For while Lutheranism poses no temptation to the remnant of faithful Catholics, the teaching of Father Feeney certainly does as is evidenced by his growing popularity among traditionally minded Catholics. It is my firm conviction that the rising popularity of Father Feeney and his teaching is nothing more than the latest assault on the remnant of faithful Catholics by the devil. First there were the modernists, and then came the dubious took bishops and their sacrilegious sacraments and the unorthodox associations with non-Catholic sects. And now it is Father Feeney and his doctrinal errors on baptism, justification, and grace. Let us not be fooled. In his second epistle to Timothy, St. Paul said, I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom Preach the word, the instant, in season and out of season. Reprove, entreat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine. For there shall come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and will indeed turn away their hearing from the truth unto fables. But be thou vigilant. Let us then, my dear people, be vigilant. Let us hold fast to sound Catholic doctrine. Let us reject the teachers with itching ears. Let us have nothing to do with the religion of the modernists, with the dubious sacraments and the sacrilegious sacraments of the Took bishops, or the grave doctrinal errors of a Father Fini. Rather, let us, as St. Paul says, Hold fast to the traditions which we have received. God bless you. Thank you. We just have uh, about 15 minutes, I think, before we have to go. And so if anyone has questions, uh, I will try to answer them. But we have to cut it off in 15 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I, I have not come across that. But it may be so. has very clearly said that there is such a thing as implicit desire. I'm sorry. The question was, uh, what about the notion of 
uh, explicit and implicit desire for baptism. In other words, the explicit desire for baptism is very clear. If someone says, I want to be baptized, I want to be a Catholic, I want to embrace the faith, that's very clear, but then there are cases of people who do not. There are people who are, let's say, for example, in good conscience, but perfect contrition for their sins, who love God above all things, who believe in our Lord, but who through no fault of their own are in ignorance of the truth of the Catholic faith. Very, very clearly, the Holy Office taught that there was such a thing and those people could be saved. Of course, obviously, it's a very, very difficult thing because the whole system of Protestantism is d designed around the notion that you don't have to really be sorry for your sins. I mean, that's a very, very deadly and destructive system because you may have someone who is well-intentioned, but who is convinced that, well, it really doesn't matter if I commit this mortal sin uh, because we're saved by faith alone. And that faith alone doctrine, by its very nature, is intrinsically irreconcilable uh, with perfect contrition. It is not, and the reason it is not is because the Council of Trent was a true general council of the Catholic Church, had infallible authority. And the Council of Trent used its infallible authority to teach that a man is justified by the labor of redemption or the desire for it. So in other words, it is not a disputed point. A Catholic is not free to believe that there is no such thing as justification or baptism of desire. A Catholic must believe that. In order to reject this, this baptism of desire, one must reject the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent. So, That's correct. One can be joined to the church by desire and intention. That's absolutely correct. Uh, could, could you stand up so everyone could hear? Thomas once? Yeah, St. Thomas was. Who overruled him? He was overruled by the church. Where? Where did the church? Okay. Uh, first of all, the teaching of St. Thomas on the Holy Eucharist was never overruled by the church. In fact, the Council of Trent took the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas and put it on the altar next to the sacred scripture. So first of all, that's, that's not true. And secondly, uh, even if one comes to the conclusion that St. Thomas's view on baptism of desire was only his theological opinion, even if one said that, for example, one cannot say that about the Council of Trent. In other words, if you are a Catholic, a Roman Catholic, and you have the faith, you must accept the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent. You are not free to reject it. A Catholic is not free to say that you cannot be justified by baptism of desire. A Catholic cannot reject that. If you reject that, you reject the infallible teaching of the church. So it's not a question of the opinion of a theologian, even of the greatest of all theologians, St. Thomas. It's a question of the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent. <coughs> Nobody disputes that. We all accept that. 
the explanation is the explanation of the church. And the explanation of the church is that a person can be justified by desire, whether you like it or you don't like it, or Father Wathen likes it or doesn't like it, or Father Feeney likes it or doesn't like it, it's black and white. The authority of the Council of Trent, the infallible teaching, is equal to the authority of Pope Eugene and equal, in a certain sense, to the authority of any of the popes. In other words, it's infallible teaching. We are not free to reject it. To reject it is to reject the infallible teaching of the Church. By that, you interpret the Council of Trent saying that the baptism of water is an absolute condition of salvation, and that if in that particular instance the Council of Trent is rejecting the notion that you can be justified by desire, then the Council of Trent is contradicting itself. So in other words, an infallible doctrinal council of the church says one thing in one place and one thing in the other place. That, that's the conclusion you would have to draw if you give that interpretation to what the council say. So clearly, that is not what the council meant. In other words, there is a, a liberal tendency and there is this uh, movement to minimize the importance of the church for salvation and the sacraments. But that doesn't justify going to the other extreme. So in other words, what the council says in one decree must be reconciled to what it says in another decree. So the decree on justification where it says clearly, I mean, it's, it's as in black and white as anyone could possibly want it, it says clearly that a person is justified by the labor of redemption or the desire thereof. It's just absolutely clear that a person is put into the state of justification by water, the actual waters of baptism, or the desire thereof. Therefore, whatever else the council says must be reconciled to that. I mean, there's just no way to get around it, because the only other conclusion is that the Holy Ghost didn't know what he was doing in one section of the council, but he did know what he was doing in the other. Well, uh, since I uh, started to do this research, I mean, I had read things about Father Feeney and uh, what he believed and so forth many, many years ago. I've written letters about it. <clears throat> I've had uh, acquaintances who were very infatuated with the teaching of Father Feeney, but I, I never really got into it to the degree that I did in preparation for this uh, talk. And I would say that what Father Feeney is implicitly denying is certain dogmas of faith. In other words, it is a dogma of faith that if you're in a state of sanctifying grace, you have a right to heaven. If someone comes along and says, this person in the state of grace has a right to heaven, but this person doesn't, that is a heresy. So I would say, I mean, I have no authority to, to render definitive judgments about anything, but I would say that he implicitly denies uh, a dogma of the Catholic faith. And to deny a dogma of the Catholic faith is the very definition of heresy. Even to, to doubt it, it's not necessary for a person actually to deny it. All they have to do is to call it into question, and that is heresy. And Father Feeney, I mean, quite frankly, I don't understand it. Father Feeney knew what sanctifying grace was. He was a Jesuit. He went to, to, uh, to schools of philosophy and theology. He studied the manuals. I'm sure he must have studied St. Thomas Aquinas. He had to have studied the tract on sanctifying grace. He would have to know that if you're in a state of grace and you die in the state of grace, you're saved. It's, it's 
It's an outrageous absurdity to suggest that a person in the state of grace cannot be saved. It's just absolutely outrageous. And so to answer your question, I would say the position of Father Feeney is at least implicitly heretical because to affirm what he affirms, you must deny what the church teaches. I have a nasty down to simplify That's a good quality. <laughs> you learned it from your wife. <laughs> Justification, into a state of grace. And I believe that many of my born again Christian friends will make it under this doctrine. Well, <laughs> they have a hard time because this system that they believe in teaches them that it's okay to sin. In other words, uh, it's not just a question of desiring baptism. You could have a person who is living in a state of mortal sin and who doesn't love God, but who desires baptism. Just a simple desire for baptism is not sufficient. They must also have perfect contrition for their sins. And, and again, you know, God is the searcher of hearts. If you believe in a system, your entire system tells you that it isn't sin that really matters. It's only faith that matters. We all know temptation. And we all know that sometimes it's a great struggle to do what's right and to do uh, what's, uh, what's good. And we also know that at times we, when we face temptation, we say that I can't do this. To do this is to reject our Lord. To do this is to jeopardize my soul. But if you're a, a Protestant, even a born-again Protestant, your whole system tells you that when you're in the midst of that fierce and terrible temptation, that you can do it. You know, you, you can actually do it. Your theology says you can do it and you don't have to worry that it's not going to cause you to lose your soul. So in the practical order, if people uh, operate on a system like that, how many have perfect contrition for their sins? And I don't know. I personally tend to believe everything in the church about the trend. And I pray that if I'm wrong on this, Okay, then you believe you can be justified by desire for baptism, right? I believe you can have justification, though. Okay, and you believe that puts you in a state of grace? Yes. And you believe that if you die in a state of grace, you go to heaven? Yes. Okay. I also believe that, why is it unreasonable to believe the sense that also needed, even trans needed, that it is necessary for, for the water, the baptism of water, the water is necessary for baptism? Well, the desire for it. Well, the, the says that. No, 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 the council says that. But why is it unreasonable to say that someone has a desire for it? Since it is needed, the water is necessary. But they will receive water prior to that. Why is yeah, it unreasonable the, to believe Yeah, but the council says it, though. In other words, the council says that, that uh, justification is brought about by the labor of regeneration or the desire thereof. Now, in the practical order, uh, the question is that you could have a person who is studying to be a Catholic, who has the faith, who loves God above all things, has perfect contrition for his sins, but he's on his way to church. And he could be in a car accident and get killed. Could happen. Would, Couldn't it happen? Well, I would wonder that if the uh, previous teachings are to be taken literally as church, but after a place is held of Father, that our Lord would not allow that yeah, but are you denying that you can? Are you denying that you can be justified by desire? No, I'm not denying that. Okay, and that you can be put in the state of sanctifying grace, I'm not denying. and that if you're in a state of sanctifying grace, you're a child of God, and you have a right to heaven. And before you die, our Lord no, 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 no. The <laughs> you're in a. You like Father Feeney, I'm afraid. Father Feeney backed himself into a corner. You know what I mean? And in backing himself into corners, he put on blinders. And in putting on those blinders, he had to reject things which were very plain and very straightforward. There is just no way that any supporter of Father Feeney can get away from the infallible teaching of the Council of Trent, that you can be justified by desire, that if you are justified, you're in a state of grace. If you're in a state of grace, you are truly sanctified, 
you are a child of God and you have an, you are, you are an heir of heaven. So that if you do die before you receive the waters of baptism, you are saved. There's just no way to get around it. It's black and white. Right, if it were intrinsically necessary, and here, you know, here's where the problem is, too. Father Feeney fails to make another very important distinction. Uh, he makes a distinction in the book between what's called necessity of means and necessity of precept. I'm sure if you've read his works, you've read that distinction. Necessity of precept is something which is commanded, but which is not essential. Necessity of means is something that is essential. So Father Feeney says, uh, baptism of water is necessary by necessity of means, and he's correct. But what he fails to do is to make another distinction that theologians make, and is the distinction between something that is intrinsically necessary and something that is hypothetically necessary. And, and here's what is meant by that. It is intrinsically necessary for salvation to love God. If a person dies hating God, he cannot go to heaven. It is intrinsically impossible. There is nothing that can supply for the lack of love of God. There is nothing that can overshadow the hatred, let's say, in the soul of that person. So the love of God is intrinsically necessary. But baptism of water is not intrinsically necessary. It is hypothetically necessary. In other words, our Lord made it necessary but he did not bind himself in such a way that he would not have the power to save a person who did not receive the waters of baptism. And that is why the Council of Trent says the, the labor of regeneration or the desire thereof. You just can't get away from it. And Father Feeney, and again, he was a Jesuit. He spent a long time studying philosophy and theology. This is a very fundamental distinction which he does not make. He does not tell his readers. We'll take one, two more questions. <laughs> then don't. <laughs> we we believe it, and we do with all our heart and soul. We do. Do you think the council? Of, you don't get around it. You just explain it. I mean. There are very many things uh, which have to be explained. For example, our Lord said, uh, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. That's a pretty categorical statement. But that little baby that was baptized this morning never received communion. If God forbid that baby died, that baby would go straight to heaven. Someone could come along and say, that baby can't go to heaven, has never received communion. And our Lord said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. Well, what is it you have to understand? Our Lord said you must hate your mother and father. Did he mean that you must hate your mother and father? He didn't mean that. He meant that whenever there is a choice between God and any other creature, you must choose God first. There are many things in theology that are very subtle. Even, for example, the question of the three baptisms. It's another simple distinction which Father Feeney does not make. The Baltimore Catechism and Cardinal Gibbons did not say there were three sacraments of baptism, they said rather there were three baptisms and St. Thomas explains it the baptism of blood and baptism of desire are not strictly speaking sacraments so the unity of the sacrament of baptism is in no way damaged by saying that there is baptism of desire and of blood but that's a cardinal <laughs> but thank you <laughs> Right, and that's why we have uh, the authoritative judgments of popes and councils. Right. I agree. Oh, okay, you first. Follow up the simple first step. Instead of born again Christians, what would we do as pagans in baptism? How would we do that? Well, 
again, it, it's not for us to, to judge, but, you know, we, we are not God. We don't have to judge. We don't have to determine who does and who does not get to heaven. God is the one. All we have to do is to hold fast to what has been taught by the church and is solidly defined. And if we do that, then there's no problem, you know? We just leave it in God's hands. Uh, the the, the, uh, the, uh, the minimizing of the doctrine that the church is necessary for salvation is a grave error. And that's why I said last night and this morning even that in a sense Father Feeney did have a point. There was, there was a point that the Catholics should go out and should preach. Uh, it should be uh, preached throughout the whole world that our Lord established only one church and that one church is the Catholic Church and that all other religions are false religions and that there is a positive obligation binding under pain of mortal sin for men and women throughout the whole world to enter the Catholic Church that should be preached but the fact that it is not preached is no excuse for us to embrace others so just two more questions and that's it yeah. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, the last one right here. There is, yes. Brother Jenkins probably knows the name. He's looking it up right now. He'll give it to you afterwards. <laughs> The Holy Innocent. Once the child reaches the age of discretion, don't they, and for the age of reason, don't they reach kind of a moral fork in the road? Even if they, even if they haven't, let's say a child has never received baptism, comes to the age of reason, aren't they capable of positing that first act of free will that they exercise that is that would be morally evaluated? Is it possible for that to be a, an act of free will that would be down to their sanctification? Uh, I'm not really sure that I understand the well, question, or that I have the time to answer. Yes. Point that they reach the age of Correct. Isn't it possible also at that point don't they reach a sort of moral? They make choices. A moral fork in the road. I mean, they do. Isn't that child also whether they've been baptized or not capable of choosing God as their highest good as opposed to themselves? Absolutely. Yes. There is a natural law. They're able to discern the natural law. And either to abide by it or reject so at, at the moment of their uh, at the moment of their reaching age of reason, aren't they either in the state their first act of free will that's morally uh, if they do something that's grievously wrong, they commit a mortal sin. But, but I really gotta go. <laughs> Father, it's giving me the signal back there. So maybe we could just stand for prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Most sacred heart of Jesus, O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.